have a bio uh, at your table on today's speaker, David Poitras, and uh, he had a very distinguished career both in law, uh, serving in the military, and in numerous capacities in public service, the most recent being elected in 1992 as Commissioner of the Department of Labor. He was resoundingly re-elected to that post in 1994, and he's, uh, he's got a department that I think by and large is unknown to most people, although I think everyone is affected by it. And I, I really welcome the opportunity to welcome him here today because David and I came into state government about the same time. Uh, we were young guys back then, and uh, the years have put a few wrinkles on our face and a few gray hairs on our head, but, but nevertheless, he's a, he's a good guy. He's one of the good guys, and he'll shoot straight with you and answer any question you have. But without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to welcome and have you help join in welcoming uh, David Porter. Thank you, Jeff. <coughs> Good morning. Am I on? Yeah. Glad, to, glad to be with you this morning. Griff, thank you for that introduction. I, uh, I was telling Griff when I got here that I needed uh, overheads. And I, I, this is the first time in my life that I have ever used an overhead. But this, this topic is so complicated that I thought uh, it would be useful and helpful to have it. Uh, oh, is that better? Does that work? We need a technical person. Am I, am I all? Does it have a switch? Ah. <laughs> yes, okay. Better? Okay. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> this was such a technical subject that overheads would be helpful. Uh, I had an experience uh, out at the uh, Cobb Civic Center last week in which I heard a young man uh, at 7.30 in the morning attempt to do 30 minutes of stand-up comedy. And uh, that, was, uh, that was an excruciating 30 minutes, but I, I did thought that I would uh, share a story with you this morning before we get into the really heavy stuff. Uh, this is a story about true American values. The two young boys were playing in the field at the edge of the woods and uh, came across the abandoned well uh, covered over with boards. And as boys will always do, they tore the, tore the boards up and uh, peered down into the well black as night, uh, couldn't see a thing, couldn't, couldn't tell where the bottom was. The first little boy says, well, said, let's throw a rock in, see how deep it is. Well, certainly they, they threw the rock in and listened, and they never heard it hit the bottom. And the second little boy said, well, let's, let's throw a bigger rock in. So they found a bigger, bigger stone nearby, and they wrestled it over, and they threw it into the well, and nothing. And the boy said, gosh, this, this well must not have a bottom. And so they said, well, let's throw something even bigger. So they found a, a railroad cross tie nearby, and they wrestled and struggled, and they heaved it over in the well, and they listened and never heard anything. And then they were turning to find something else, and this little boy said, good Lord, look at this. And charging across the field straight at him was this rather large billy goat with his head down and his horns bared and just charging straight to him. And they were just terrified, had no idea what to do. And, the, the goat got right to him, and the goat just dove headfirst into the well and disappeared. And they turned to each other and said, that's the darndest thing I've ever seen. I, I can't imagine what's, what happened here. And they turned to go home, and, and the farmer walked by, and the farmer said, young man, I've, I've lost my goat. He said, I've, my prized goat uh, was around here somewhere, and I just can't seem, can't seem to find him. Uh, do you know anything about it? And the, the older little boy said, well, sir, said, I, we, I hate to tell you this, but I've got to tell you the truth. Uh, your goat just came over here and just dove headfirst into that well, and he's gone forever. And the farmer said, no, no, that, that couldn't have been my goat. <laughs> my goat was tied to a cross tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's Griff. Uh, as Griff said, uh, our, our operation is uh, somewhat obscure unless you uh, own and operate your own business, so you may not know a lot about what the Department of Labor does. Uh, we, we are a tax collecting agency. We collect uh, uh, something on the order of $350 million a year in taxes from Georgia business, and uh, that's what I want to talk to you about, what happens to that money and where it goes. And to do that, I need to give you a an overview of how the unemployment insurance system operates. Uh, we, we, we operate in three principal spheres in the Department of Labor. The first is job training, and uh, if you, some of you may have some questions about that later on. I'd be glad to try to answer them. As you know, there's some ser serious legislation pending in Congress on that subject. 
Uh, the second is job placement, which is self-explanatory, and the third is the unemployment insurance system, and that's what we're talking about today. The unemployment insurance system is funded by two taxes. There's a federal tax and a state tax, and they're both payroll taxes, and they are collected at different times and different, using different forms at different tax rates, but they go to pay for essentially the same thing, and that is the unemployment insurance system. The state tax is collected by the Department of Labor, as it is in every state, uh, quarterly. That money is placed in a state-specific trust, which is managed by the federal government. Uh, I will tell you, by the way, that it is managed very effectively. We, we collect about 7.5% uh, per year in the last two years, uh, insured money. Uh, we earn around $80 million a year interest on our, on our trust. Those funds are used exclusively to pay benefits. The other tax is collected by the IRS, called the Federal Unemployment Tax Act tax. It is collected by the IRS, uh, which then turns the money over to the United States Department of Labor. They use it for a number of things, uh, the most important of which is to uh, fund the administrative costs of state labor departments. So the net effect of that is Georgia businesses pay money to IRS, IRS gives it to the U.S. Department of Labor, and the U.S. Department of Labor gives it back to us. There, therein lies one of the aspects of this system that we don't particularly like. <coughs> I'm going to show you uh, two, two slides this morning. One is a description or, or describes the current uh, flow of funds, and then the second is uh, describes uh, the proposal that I have made to, uh, to anybody that will listen. Uh, I have taken it to a, an ad hoc subcommittee of the U.S. Uh, House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, it was very favorably re received. Uh, the chairman indicated that uh, he wanted to hold hearings this year. Uh, in the meantime, the National Conference of Governors uh, has uh, studied the idea based on uh, some documentation that we have produced, and uh, two weeks ago they endorsed the idea uh, to the Congress. So we think this is an idea that whose time has come. Uh, the implications financially and politically are very significant. And as we go through it, I think you will see that it is, it is very much in keeping with a lot of the current political thinking about devolving power to the states, uh, giving states more latitude and flexibility in managing their own money, and cutting taxes. It does all of those things, and it does it in a way that is, that is legally fairly simple, uh, administratively not particularly complicated, and politically, I think, very realistic. So this is something, uh, although it is complex, although it is far-reaching, it is something that is eminently doable. And I think there's at least an even chance that we will see it done uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> this, this is your uh, simplified slide. Let's look for a minute on the right side. Uh, you, you, you see that uh, uh, the green arrow coming in from the right refers to general revenue, which is uh, appropriated by the Congress to the United States Department of Labor. And then you see the four uh, smaller arrows to the right. Uh, that money comes back to the states through something in excess of 200, quote, training programs. Uh, it is then uh, filtered down to the states. Uh, we then uh, filter it down to local planning and training organizations, uh, which at least in theory develops our workforce to be competitive in a global economy. Frankly, that system does not work very well. It has grown up over a long period of time to serve different constituent groups. Uh, it, just, it just needs a lot of correction. Uh, that is the subject of the two employment and training bills which are now pending in the House. Uh, the, the move is toward block granting that money in, in single grants to the states and giving the governors a lot more flexibility about how to spend it. Uh, that will happen. It needs to happen. Uh, that, that's the training part of what we do. Uh, what, what I'm really focusing on today is the left-hand side of the slide. If you'll begin, begin with the, uh, the green box on the left, that represents the federal tax, not the state benefit tax, but the federal administrative tax. 
As you can see, it goes from Georgia employers uh, to the U.S. Department of Labor, 100% uh, of it. Uh, I, I might point out that in that collection process, IRS is paid approximately $80 million a year just to collect that tax. Uh, it is transmitted to the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, at the upper left, you see a dollar sign that says money going to other states. Actually, that, that doesn't quite adequately describe what happens. It goes to three places. It goes to other states which uh, do not collect enough tax to pay their own operating expenses. Uh, those are uh, generally very small states, Idaho, the Dakotas, uh, states who, which just simply do not have enough uh, business base to generate the tax uh, to pay for their operating costs. It does not necessarily represent inefficiency. It, it would be easy to say that, but uh, it, it's more a factor of their size than their level of efficiency. But the bottom line is that some of that money is used to subsidize the operations of some smaller states. That is not a lot of money in the big picture. It's about $20 million a year, which in this uh, arena is not a lot of money. The second thing that that money goes for is to pay for the operating expenses of the United States Department of Labor. That is a very large number, uh, and we think it needs to be a lot smaller. And the third place that that other money goes is to a system of trust accounts. There are three trust accounts uh, maintained by the United States Department of Labor. Uh, one is what they call the administrative account, which uh, uh, I guess is more or less uh, self-explanatory. The second is what they call the extended benefit accounts, which is um, uh, in theory at least a, a, a rainy day account that the government can draw on to authorize extended benefits in a protracted economic downturn. The third trust is what they call the, uh, well, we call it the loan account, and it is, author it is there so that the federal government can make loans to states which exhaust their benefit accounts. Uh, those three trust funds collectively represent something in the neighborhood of $35 billion. The money that is not, shall I say, siphoned off or, or <laughs> pulled off to the side uh, for those expenditures is returned to uh, what we call assessors in our business, the State Employment Security Administrations. Those are the, the state labor departments, in other words, uh, of the state employment security agencies. And then we, we use that money to run the employment service, which is the job placement activity, and the unemployment insurance activity, which is self-explanatory. Now, bear in mind, uh, this is administrative money only. We're talking about salaries, lights, water, paper clips, and so forth. <clears throat> But one of the big problems with this, in addition to the money that is, that is not, uh, or that is, that is directed toward other activities, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems with this is <clears throat> that we get back in Georgia <clears throat> approximately 41 cents on the dollar. Of all of the feudal tax that Georgia business pays to the IRS for the purpose of running uh, the Employment Security Agency or the Employment Security Operation in Georgia, we get back about 41 cents. Uh, I don't, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about that. And that is frankly what triggered this whole examination. About 18 months ago, we started taking a very hard look at this, and it was at that time that we came up with this proposal to devolve the administration of the unemployment security system back to the states. Not completely. Uh, we're not suggesting that the system be dismantled. Uh, we're not suggesting that there not be serious national oversight so that we have a, na a, a reasonably uniform national system. But we are suggesting that the U.S. Department of Labor get out of the micromanagement business and simply enforce general national standards, give us uh, at least more, if not all, of our own money back and give us the flexibility to use it to run our business in a way that makes sense for us. So this is the, this is the proposal.
<coughs> again, again, starting on the right, you see that uh, we're recommending, and, and indeed Congress has already pretty much decided that they want to go to a one-block grant uh, appropriation to the states for training. That's, that's pretty much going to happen. On the left-hand side, again, beginning with the green box, uh, we are recommending that the, the FUTA tax, that is the federal tax, be collected by the states. The marginal cost to the state of Georgia to collect a federal tax is practically nothing. Uh, the $80 million that goes to pay IRS could simply be eliminated. Uh, there is, that, is a, that is an eminently doable proposition. That's something we could accomplish in a matter of, of weeks in terms of redesigning forms and, and computer systems and that kind of thing. We're proposing that we collect the entire uh, amount of money, both the, the benefit tax and the federal FUTA administrative tax. The benefit tax, uh, it's not represented here, but the benefit tax would continue to go into the benefit trusts, which is our trust, state-specific, and very healthy, by the way. Uh, the, the FUTA tax we would keep here. Instead of sending it to Washington and having them send it back to us, we would simply keep it here. Now, the U.S. Department of Labor has obviously got to have some money to run on, and, and I would not suggest for a minute that uh, the Congress would appropriate general revenue. That politically would not happen. Uh, what I am recommending is that the Congress set the budget for the United States Department of Labor and that annually the states be assessed a pro rata portion of that based on covered wages within that state. Uh, and we, we believe that the United States Department of Labor could be run very effectively on uh, something on the order of 1% of total FUTA collection. Now that, that number is obviously negotiable. It could go up 5, it could go up 10, it could go up 15 or 20, and we would still be coming out way ahead. We'd be getting back, even at 20, we'd be getting back 80% versus 40% on our money. The, what was not sent to the United States Department of Labor would be retained within the states uh, and then used to, to manage the unemployment uh, insurance system and the employment service system. Uh, one, one feature about this, actually I may have not uh, characterized it exactly correctly, the 99 percent that we're showing as staying in the state actually would be remitted to Washington and would be managed by the United States Treasury. Uh, I, for one, do not favor setting up a situation which would create another Orange County. Uh, I don't think 53 jurisdictions ought to be handling that administrative money and, and trying to invest it locally. Uh, these systems are too important and too sensitive, uh, and frankly, the national government do, does it effectively enough that I, I have no problem with their actually investing the money. What I do think is important is that the states have unrestricted access to their own administrative money so that uh, myself and my counterparts around the country don't have to go to Washington hat in hand asking for our own money back and explaining why we need to spend this nickel here and this dime there and uh, having somebody mi micromanage our business day to day and tell us when and how much of our own money we can have back. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll just leave that up there. The, as I said a moment ago, this is an idea whose time, <clears throat> in my opinion, has come. I have not found anybody except the United States Department of Labor uh, who has any big heartburn with this. Uh, we think, uh, and they, frankly, their principal objection is that, uh, that they would not be getting as much money. Uh, privately, a number of them have said to me that uh, they think this is a very sensible approach to funding uh, this very large segment of the federal and state governments. But uh, their biggest concern is uh, the amount of money that would be available to, uh, flowing into their agency to fund their operations. The biggest objection <clears throat> and the only substantial objection that I have heard is the way the money that flows into the trust accounts is treated, the federal trust accounts that I mentioned a minute ago. <clears throat> something on the order of $35, $36 billion in those trust accounts, we are not recommending that they be eliminated. We're not recommending that they be collapsed. We are recommending that those of them which are composed of state money 
be made available to the states. The important factor about the trust is they, they count on the asset side of the national balance sheet. They count against the national debt. And the Congressional Budget Office, at least preliminarily, has taken the position that if the states have unrestricted access to their own administrative money, then those trust accounts would have to come off the asset side of the balance sheet and uh, the national debt would at least in the, appear to balloon substantially uh, once those assets were removed. I do not agree with that analysis uh, for, uh, while I'm not an accountant. Uh, the fact is that the states have unrestricted access to our own benefit trusts, yet they are counted on the asset side of the balance sheet. I don't understand how you can treat one trust one way and the other trust the other way from an accounting standpoint. Uh, I believe if we can overcome that accounting uh, technicality, uh, this thing can be made to happen and it will be a great day for the United States and a great day for Georgia. Uh, my, my estimate is conservatively, uh, if this happens, we would be in line to, to authorize a tax cut in Georgia on the magnitude of $75 million a year, immediately. So that's the, uh, that's the proposal. It's, uh, as I said at the outset, I think it is, it is legally very simple. Uh, only a couple of laws need to be changed. Uh, administratively, it is fairly simple. It'll take us uh, uh, perhaps eight or nine months to make it happen. Uh, politically, it is very doable. The only group that we can find uh, that has any objection are our friends in the U.S. Department of Labor uh, and the Congressional Budget Office uh, their, their objection is not so much on principle as it is on the accounting technicalities of how the trust handle. The national governors, I think, are going to uh, pursue this, uh, continue to pursue this aggressively, and if they do, and if we do, uh, and Governor Miller, by the way, has endorsed this idea, uh, we can make it happen, and uh, I'll be delighted if it does.